Hello and welcome to another Drug Chug episode and today we're going to talk about factor 10A inhibitors. They could also be called NOAX, DOAX, or anticoagulants. In this video we'll talk about everything you need to know about these factor 10A inhibitors. So let's jump right in. So here's a breakdown of everything in this video. There'll be timestamps down below. And as always, there'll be a short quiz at the end to see what we retained. To first understand this class of drugs, we're going to need to talk about a quick overview of the factor 10A inhibitors. So right off the bat, these are all anticoagulants, meaning they either stop or prevent blood clots from forming. And we have a total of four drugs in this class. So first we have Rivaroxaban, which is Xeralto. We have Apixaban, which is Eliquis. We have Adoxaban, which is Cevesa. And we have Batrixaban, which is Bavexa. So all of these drugs do the same thing, right? They're factor 10A inhibitors, and we'll go into detail what that actually means. But a general idea is that all of these are anticoagulants. However, you're going to see rivaroxaban and apixaban prescribed more often typically, especially when you go in a hospital setting. And the reason for that is that only these two have an antidote to reverse its effects. And that antidote is andexanant alpha. So prescribers feel more comfortable giving a drug that has an antidote. And all that antidote does is it reverses the anticoagulation, meaning when you take the antidote, it just stops the drug from thinning the blood too much. Now, continuing with an overview, a lot of students, patients, doctors will have different names for this specific class of drugs. You might have heard of NOAX, DOAX, factor 10A inhibitors, Zybans. They're all basically the same thing. And the good way to learn this is to go back in history. So if you're following the drug chug course, we talked about warfarin earlier. And we said warfarin was the first anticoagulant in the market, and it was approved back in 1954. Now, if we fast forward in time, we have more and more drugs being presented. So if we fast forward to around 2010, that's when all of these drugs came out. And at the time, we called them NOAX, meaning Novel Oral Anticoagulants, or New Oral Anticoagulants. Now, as time went on, these drugs lost their unique newness, so to speak, right? So we eventually changed the name to DOAX because they're not new anymore. So that just stood for Direct Oral Anticoagulants. And the reason I bring this up is because when you read a piece of literature or when you have a conversation with an older physician or whatever it might be, just know that they might use another term like NOAC so that you're familiar with what they're talking about. Okay, so now let's dig a little bit deeper and figure out how these factor 10A inhibitors actually work. What's their mechanism of action? And to discuss that, we need to talk about the clotting cascade. And this is how your body goes from bleeding, let's say you get a finger paper cut, to not bleeding, right? We want that paper cut to scab over so blood doesn't constantly leak out. And we've talked about this before in the drug chug course, we went into detail. But as a quick overview of the clotting cascade, we have two sides, right? We have the intrinsic pathway, which means damage from the inside, and the extrinsic pathway, meaning damage from the outside. And both these pathways have various clotting factors that activate each other. And they both essentially meet in the middle at factor 10. And then factor 10 activates factor 2. And then factor 2 activates factor 1, which is our fibrin. And this is the whole point of the clotting cascade. So the reason for this is if we look at a blood clot, like this one here, it's made up of two things. It's made up of platelets, which are just circulating in your blood, and fibrin, which basically bundle them together to have a strong blood clot. So now let's talk about how these factor 10A inhibitors work. So if we have a patient like this one here, 
and we give them rivaroxaban, well, it's going to block that factor 10. Specifically, it's the activated version of the factor 10 because all these clotting factors you see have an inactive and active version. And when it blocks the factor 10A or the 10 activated clotting factor, then we block clotting factor 2, then we block clotting factor 1. And remember, that was our goal of the clotting cascade. So if we block fibrin 1, then we block the fibrin that's needed to make that blood clot. And that's how these drugs thin the blood. This is how they are anticoagulants, right? We block factor 10 to block fibrin, and fibrin's needed to make the blood clots. Now, one thing to note here is that all these factor 10A inhibitors end in Zyban, right? X-A-B-A-N. And the X-A is there on purpose. It's for factor 10A. So just try to pick that up. Try to notice how Zyband 10A, okay, it blocks factor 10. We know that's for the clotting cascade to thin the blood or to be an anticoagulant. Now that we know how these factor 10A inhibitors work, let's talk about when we actually use them in our patients. The first indication is if a patient has something called atrial fibrillation, which is an irregular heartbeat, specifically the top of the heart, the atria, isn't pumping correctly. This could lead to poor blood flow circulation, and if the blood's not flowing properly, it could lead to a blood clot. The next thing is if a patient has or is at risk of developing a deep vein thrombosis or a DVT, and that's just a blood clot that's in the deep vein, usually in the leg, and there's two doses we usually look at, either prophylaxis, meaning they don't have one yet, or treatment meaning they have one at this time and we need to fix that blood clot. Next is if a patient is at risk of getting a pulmonary embolism or currently has a pulmonary embolism, we could give them one of these factor 10A inhibitors. And that's just a blood clot that basically traveled to the lungs. And this is a very serious blood clot. There's a high rate of instant death if that blood clot reaches the lung. And here we also have a prophylaxis dose and a treatment dose. And finally, we could also see these drugs being used after surgery. So the most common is if a patient has a knee replacement surgery or a hip replacement surgery, that puts a lot of stress on the body. So they have a higher chance to clot and form a blood clot after the surgery. So then we would give them the medication to reduce the risk of developing a blood clot. All right, so now it's time to actually talk about the dosing and the adjustment to the dosing of all of these factor 10A inhibitors. I'm not going to lie to you. This is a lot of information. If you're working in a hospital or a clinic, it's better to just go to the clinical pharmacist and ask for his help because you'll see how much information there is. The first thing to note here, though, is most of these dosings depend on creatinine clearance. So we have to look at that and see how well their kidneys function. So starting with rivaroxaban or Xeralto, if a patient has atrial fibrillation, we could start them on a 20 milligram daily dose with food if their creatinine clearance is greater than 50. Or we lower it to 15 milligrams daily with or without food if their creatinine clearance is between 15 to 50. If the patient has a DVT or a pulmonary embolism, then we give them 15 milligrams twice a day for 21 days, and then we only give them 20 milligrams daily. If the patient's at risk of developing a DVT, then we give them the prophylaxis dose, and that's just 10 milligrams daily. All right, now moving on to apixaban or Eliquis. So here, if a patient has a fibrillation again, we have 5 milligrams twice a day, or we drop it to 2.5 milligrams twice a day if there are two of these that are true. If the patient's greater than 80 years old, if they're less than 60 kilograms in weight, or if their serum creatinine is more than 1.5. If a patient has a DVT or pulmonary embolism, 
we just give them 10 milligrams twice a day for the seven days, and then we drop it to five milligrams twice a day. And the prophylactic dose would be 2.5 milligrams twice a day. All right, two down, two to go. Next is Adoxaban, brand name Cervesa. And if a patient has AFib, we give them 60 milligrams daily if their creatinine clearance is between 50 and 95. Or we drop it down to 30 milligrams daily if their creatinine clearance is 15 to 50. Now, a very special note here. If the creatinine clearance is more than 95 or less than 15, we cannot use this drug because it clears too fast. If the patient currently has a blood clot, we give 60 milligrams daily if they weigh more than 60 kilograms, or we drop it to 30 milligrams daily if they weigh less than 60 kilograms. And our final drug is Batrixaban. And here we only have a prophylaxis dose for a DVT. And this is the easiest one. The first dose is 160 milligram. And then after that, we give the patient 80 milligrams daily. This was by far the hardest part of this video. But again, if you work in a hospital, work with your team. Talk to your pharmacist. Get this information from them. All right, hang in there. We're almost done. So some quick clinical pearls and side effects we see. And the first thing to note is there are no routine blood tests that we use for these factor 10A inhibitors. This is unlike warfarin, which we talked about needs INR. These are more predictable, so we don't need these tests. The second thing is that these drugs work very fast. They work on the activated clotting factor 10. And this is also different than warfarin because we said warfarin has a delayed time. These work very fast. The third thing here is kidney function. We talked about this before. These drugs are eliminated through the kidney. That's why there's a lot of variable dosing. And the last thing is bleeding risk. Any anticoagulant is going to have the risk to push a patient to bleed more. All right, so that's everything you need to know about these factor 10A inhibitors, DOAX, NOAX, whatever you want to call them. So let's have a quick summary and then a quiz. So first we talked about the four drugs. We talked about Rivaroxaban, brand name Zeralto, Apixaban, brand name Eliquis, and Adoxaban, brand name Cervesa, and Batrixaban, or Bevexa. Out of these, these two right here, Rivaroxaban and Apixaban, are the most popular partially because they both have an antidote, and that antidote's name was Endexinit Alpha. Now, we learned how all of these drugs work. They block clotting factor 10, the active form of clotting factor 10, which blocks the clotting cascade from going to clotting factor 2 to clotting factor 1. So that means we have no fibrin. We know that blood clots need both platelets and fibrin. Since we block fibrin, we block blood clots. The reason we use these drugs is because if a patient has atrial fibrillation, if they have a deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism, or if we use it, we use it for after surgery. And that's for a prophylactic dose to prevent a blood clot from occurring because of the stresses from a surgery. And any anticoagulant we know has the risk to cause bleeding, and that's a black box warning, and all of these anticoagulants can push a patient to bleed more. All right, now with all that, let's take a short quiz to see what we retain. All right, question one. Which of the following factor 10A inhibitors have an antidote? Question two. Which clotting factor does rivaroxaban block? Question three. Which of the following is most likely a side effect from DOAX? Question four, what is the name of the antidote used to reverse rivaroxaban and apixaban?